That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about The Book of Clarence, the sophomore film directed by James Samuel, uh, which is being released courtesy of Sony on January 12th, 2024. Do you know James' first movie? Yeah, we reviewed it. You didn't watch it, though. Oh. The Harder They Fall from 2021. So you reviewed it. Yes. Yeah. And I remember thinking, kind of similarly to how I felt about this, uh, there are a lot of interesting elements, a fantastic cast, and and some things, at least in The Heart of They Fall, that felt a, maybe a little bit derivative in the story. Uh, but it's also worth noting that James Samuel is better known as The Bullets. Uh, he's a British singer-songwriter and also the younger sibling of Seal. What is this movie about? Struggling to find a better life, Clarence is captivated by the power of the rising messiah and soon risks everything to carve a path to a divine existence. What's your pull quote? Sometimes funny, sometimes funky, and sometimes fearless. The book of Clarence ultimately feels like a satire hampered by sincerity, unaware of how significantly subversive it is. Uh, it's sort of like the black temptation of Christ. That's a good one. Mine. While it doesn't reach its full potential, the book of Clarence is an impressive effort that's worth a watch. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... Clarence is played by Lakeith Stanfield. Mm -hmm. He lives in Jerusalem. It's 33 AD. Mm -hmm. And we're told that he lives in like lower... Lower Jerusalem. So it's supposed to be like the hood. And it's, it's mainly black people we see. I think the terminology they use is gypsy territory with the signage. So he, Clarence, is in love with a woman named Verinia. Mm -hmm. Who we know from the movie Nanny. Mm -hmm. What's her uh, character's, or the actor's name? Anna Diop. Yeah. So Clarence is in love with Verinia, and Verinia happens to be the sister of Jedediah. Mm -hmm. And Jedediah is like the criminal underlord of this part of town. So Clarence has a problem because he can't really get the affection of Verinia because he believes, or he believes that she doesn't want him because he's a nobody, even though he doesn't think he's a nobody. And he owes Jedediah money. And Jedediah has told him, if you don't run me my money within 29 days, it's curtains. So what happens? The movie's broken up into three chapters. The first chapter is called The 13th Apostle. So it's 33 AD. So around the time Jesus of Nazareth was running around in these streets. And the, the year he was crucified, yeah. So Clarence has the bright idea, oh, I can just become the 13th Apostle. And I'll get money and notoriety and Jedediah will leave me alone and Verinia will love me. So he goes to visit the apostles and we see that one of them is his twin brother, Thomas, who is also portrayed by Lakeith Stanfield. Mm -hmm. And we see that they do not have a good relationship. Throughout the film, Clarence keeps saying to Thomas, you left mom and I. And that's kind of all he explains. But Thomas is telling him, you will never be an apostle. But one of the other apostles, Judas, tells him, oh, if you go free a bunch of slaves, that might be a reason we'll let you in. Mm -hmm. So Clarence tries. He does free one who's important to the story named Barabbas. Barabbas? Barabbas, sorry. Played who by I, Omar Sy. Who mm -hmm. I think was my favorite character. But that doesn't get him into the apostles. So then we go to chapter two, and that's called the new Messiah. So Clarence has the bright idea, literally the bright idea, to become like another Jesus. And he's successful. Because he, he's atheist and believes that Jesus is a trickster anyway. So then he's thinking, if I just run the same game, I can be like him. And he does. So... <laughs> But then this leads to chapter three, the final chapter, the crucifixion, because the Romans have been sent to basically apprehend anyone pretending to be the Messiah. Any self-proclaimed messiahs, yes. And they scoop up Clarence. The main person, the, the main Roman is played by James McAvoy. Pontius Pilate. And he says, uh, this is what you're being accused of. And Clarence is like, no, I'm a fraud. Like, I don't believe in this shit. I was just doing this to make money, to pay off some debt. James McAvoy says, well, then, so you're admitting to be a, being a fraud, so you're also in trouble. But how about this? I'm going to lock you in this, like, 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 drown you. But if you can walk on water, then I'll be the first person to be your follower. So, of course, we think Clarence is going to drown. 
but he walks across water. So you would think that that might offer him some grace, but no, they decide to crucify him. So then that's the end of the movie is that Clarence is crucified. Alongside? Alongside... A homeless man named Benjamin. Who's played by Benedict Cumberbatch. <laughs> we can get to him. Mm -hmm. But yeah, Clarence is crucified. And then we see that Jesus resurrects Clarence. Mm -hmm. The end. Just like what happened to Jesus. So I think to be clear, I... I'm not a religious person. I've never read the Bible. I don't, you know, these stories much better than I do. So I felt pretty green about what was happening in the story and what's meant to be historical or not. But yeah, I'm not religious either. So I, I don't want to use the word revisionism because I don't approach something like the Bible as facts that, that would be revised. So this feels like Bible fan fiction to me. And I'm confused about who it might be for because it's a, it's like an art house black biblical film that I'm assuming would kind of irritate people from that are either agnostic, atheists, or uh, devotees of Christianity. Yes, I agree. I also am not clear on what I was supposed to take away from the story I, because yes. Clarence's faith is only really sort of um, attained like at the very end when he walks on water and his reaction is kind of like, oh my God, I'm doing it. And then he dies. Which so. kind of get kind of has a message for us, like maybe those who are non-believers require experiencing a, mi a miracle. Which seems like the opposite of how religion works. Like right. You're supposed to blindly believe. So yeah, I'm a little confused with the message. Yes, and in the ending where he's resurrected, and uh, Jesus, who's played by Nicholas Pinnock, uh, has the quote from the Book of John about he that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall live. Well, here... Be look. Because I don't really believe... Because, oddly enough, James Samuel introduces the film him himself with a uh, film's message, uh, alluding to how this is about a man, Clarence, finding his faith. And I don't know that I believe that this man has found faith. Well, I don't believe... I, I, I don't understand the journey, because up until the very end, when this fool can walk on water, he's rejecting it. Right. So I... Like... I didn't quite see the buildup. It, it's just more like he's forced to believe because he could walk on water. That now he, while he's on the cross, he does change his manner of speech and talk about things in a different way. And I actually thought that was probably the most moving part of Lakeith's performance. I agree, and he has a really good line in there about how what we really need is enlightenment. But I don't know that this film is. Uh, to me, something like religion is the opposite of enlightenment. I wanted to talk about the intro that you just mentioned because I thought, you know, not every filmmaker should probably do this because no. some of y'all are not no. very eloquent or nice. But I thought James Samuel talking about his film was very helpful and I enjoyed hearing him speak. So I thought that was a really nice addition. I think it also proves this, his investment because he's writer, director, producer, composed all the music. Uh, and this is his second film and, and we're tackling Jesus. I mean, Scorsese took a, a while to get there. What did I like about this movie? The cinematography. Mm -hmm. uh, it was shot by Rob Hardy, who's worked with Alex Garland several many times and also did Mission Impossible Fallout. I'm assuming they didn't have the biggest budget. And I think the film looks... The director in his intro described it as an epic, like a biblical epic, like a Ben-Hur or Ten Commandments. I don't think it feels that grand, but I think it looks very slick. And a lot of the like uh, camera angles and so some of the editing choices I thought were really interesting. Mm -hmm. And then the chapter headlines and the way those look, those felt very much like yes. coming right out of yep. Ben-Hur. And, and if the film feels longer than it is, and it, I half expected an intermission. Well, we're still talking about what I like. Oh, so okay. what I, I also liked the score and the soundtrack. Yes. Very effective. It has a very like soulful, rhythmic vibe. Well, Jay-Z produced this and he's also on one of the songs. So that was a plus. I also liked the cast. Great cast. Much like The Harder They Fall. Excellent cast. And I think the writing is strong. But then getting to the negatives, I didn't like the story. We didn't finish the positives, though. Oh, what else? The cast members. Alfred Woodard. 
Well, we're going to talk about Oh, her. I thought we were still talking about positive, though. Yeah, we still oh, had okay. the cast members. Okay. So, um, but I think the story didn't quite work for me because I was left feeling like I'm not quite sure what I'm supposed to think. Um, you already mentioned this, but the movie's two hours. It felt like three. It's two hours and 15 minutes. It felt much longer. And I was getting real fidgety, mm -hmm. kind of losing my attention. Also, as much as I like Lakeith, I don't know that... Because his character is supposed to be... I find his character confusing. I do too. Because he captivates an audience, right? Like, he becomes a new messiah because he's so convincing. But I don't think the actor portraying this character was that convincing. I agree, and I don't like the montage that forces us in that shoehorns us into that either especially when there are other performances i liked better like barabbas omar Bar Sai, barabbas mm -hmm. i mean probably the only time i got emotional in the film was a scene with him or the gen well actually there are more than two the gentleman playing jedediah mm -hmm. i thought he was very strong and then uh oh my god i forgot uh elijah no well, yes, I really liked Elijah. We didn't even mention him, but Elijah plays Clarence's, like, best friend slash... He's calling him his brother. But no, the man who played Martin Luther King in Selma. David Oyelowo. David Oyelowo plays a preacher. Who's, in, who's John the Baptist. Mm -hmm. And I thought his scene was so good. His scene was actually funny. Yeah. I actually thought he would have made a better Clarence. Sure. Because he possesses the gravitas, but also the humor. Mm -hmm. Like, Keith just felt like a stoner guy... I just don't see that his journey feels more like a, like a sh that of a charlatan uh, and kind of like Steve Martin in the movie Leap of Faith, if you remember that. That's what he felt like where he, I believe he's led to a sense of humanity. Sure. But uh, yeah, he, he's just he, he just seems like a stoner to me. I don't know. But it's like he's a stoner, but he can fight because we see him fight, which we can talk about. But he's actually like I was very surprised that this character was such a proficient fighter. But then he also does things that don't make sense, like almost to the point where you would think he's kind of stupid. Mm -hmm. But then he's clearly quite smart to... Street smart, yeah. To accomplish what he has. Mm -hmm. So I just, yeah, the, the character it was confusing. And I think that there's something that doesn't work with this conflict he has with his twin, who keeps, Thomas, who keeps getting blamed for abandoning him and the mother, played by Marianne Jean-Baptiste, but he was the same age. Yeah, they're twins, so it's like... It's not like the man of the house left no. the family in, in a lurch. And, and it's also, did the, I mean, if Thomas left because he went on this mission because he was called to Christ, I feel like that isn't as despicable as, like, you left and stole all our money or something. Right, and their mom seems to be doing okay. And then, yeah, the mom seems fine. So I, so I think, considering that the film felt long and languid at times, I felt like we could have used those moments to better explain why Clarence is so upset with his brother. Mm -hmm. And I, I get the sense that the director is uh, afraid to really criticize what's going on uh, or... or anything biblical so that's why it doesn't quite feel like a satire well so that's a good segue because i thought the opening was strong because it made me think oh this is going to be a satire because most of the com i hate to say comedy because i didn't think this film was particularly funny there are several cute slash humorous moments mm -hmm. but there but i don't think it was meant to be like a comedy even though one description i read said it is um, but the bulk of that humor is in the first part of the movie. Yeah. So the film opens with Clarence and his best friend slash brother Elijah on a horse and carriage racing through a part of the town where we're told like gypsies are. Mm -hmm. And it looks like they're going to, they're either racing to win something or racing to go get something. And Tayana Taylor as Mary Magdalene is racing with them. But then Clarence and Elijah lose because this little boy, this little gypsy kid stops them mm -hmm. and i thought that was weird because the gypsy kid we see more than once basically punking clarence mm -hmm. but at the end of the movie when clarence is on the cross that little kid is crying like -hoo -hoo. i didn't understand how they're trying like there, there's growth and development that happens that i didn't understand yeah just also like jedediah deciding not to jedediah. turn to turn over uh clarence, clarence to the romans even though he was just about to annihilate <laughs> Yeah, that's my other example, is Jedediah is meant to seem like this heartless killer, but then stands up for his people, but then not really. 
So I was confused by that. Mm -hmm. Although I do like that the opening is a, a direct nod to you know the chariot racing in Ben Hur. Uh, I, but I also didn't get really much of a romance between Varinia and Clarence either. Like Anna Diop really is one of. I don't think she has anything to do. No, she's stunning. She is stunning. There is one scene I liked more than you, but I, I think I liked that the energy that it was going for and wish more of the film had felt like this is a dance scene where I think the song playing over it is called Nights Over Egypt or something like I that. I liked the song. I did too, yeah. But uh, that dance sequence didn't hit the way I think you would expect. Because even some of the, like Elijah and... Barabbas are dancing and they mm -hmm. don't seem like they're dancing to the same beat. There's someone in the background on a third beat. Lakeith is doing choreography that isn't quite where I thought it should be. Sure. But he did have fantastic hair as Clarence though. I liked Clarence's yeah. hair. Yeah. Um, okay. But some cute things. Clarence like and Elijah smoke a lot of marijuana, but they don't call it that. Uh, someone refers to it as ungodly herbs. <laughs> I thought that was cute. My favorite scene is Clarence, as part of him being, or attempting to be the 13th, as he says, apostle, he has to be corrected that it's apostle, uh, he goes to get baptized by John the Baptist, David Oyelowo. And I thought that scene was so funny. Mm -hmm. with Because <laughs> uh, John the Baptist doesn't like Clarence because he knows he's like a hooligan and he slaps him a few times. And when he finally does agree to baptize him, he damn near drowns him. And I actually thought Elijah... R.J. Kyler. Mm -hmm. Was really, really good. Mm -hmm. His energy in every scene I thought was really cute. You, We liked him also in that movie Emergency. With, with the two friends that with, are... With go, the white girls. With the drunk white girls. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Then, there's still the beginning of the film where I thought we were going to get something more subversive and satirical is Elijah and Clarence are walking when the Roman police just stop them for no reason and ask to see their identification. And then, of course, they're like, why? We didn't do anything. Well, you fit the description mm -hmm. of an assailant. And Clarence says, may I see this description? Because you're saying we both fit it and we don't look anything alike. So, and that Roman cop shows a sketch of the assailant that looks like an Egyptian hieroglyph. Yeah, like, like walk like an Egyptian. Ah. But then what even made that moment funnier is like in like 45 minutes later, we actually see that assailant. In blackface. And, and he is dressed like that <laughs> hieroglyphic. Mm -hmm. But then that's kind of where the humor ends. The next time we get something that was clearly meant to be tongue-in-cheek is when, in book two, when Clarence and his people go to visit Mary and Joseph, which I thought was so dumb. So he really thinks... Clarence goes to Mary thinking that she's going to say, yeah, Jesus is a fraud. Let me tell you all his tricks. Mm -hmm. That's what he says. Like, well, I was hoping you would tell me how he does his tricks. And I thought Alfred Woodard, who looks amazing, mm -hmm. was probably the most funny part of the movie. Well, right. And I think... Because she's trying to explain how she was a virgin. Right. <laughs> but then that's kind of where the humor ends. And I think also where the subversive slash satirical nature of the film ends. And then like you already pointed out, when we get to the end, I, I kind of felt like is the message, like all I really got from this is that it took a miracle for this person to find their faith, it which feels, seems like the opposite of what. And it feels like Jesus in the multiverse a little bit with all of these messiahs popping up and the messaging that that gives us. And I really don't, I, I really think that it could have stressed a lot further the use of white Jesus. Uh, well, let's talk about white Jesus. So uh, we see a like a homeless gentleman who's so dirty, he looks black and his hair is all locked up. and But it's obvious it's Benedict Cumberbatch. And then towards the end, Jesus approaches this homeless man and gives him the gift of being able to like get as much money as he wants. Like coins just pop out of his palm. So the first thing he does is go to, Varinia runs like a, a hair salon. So he goes to her and says, I want to be clean. So they hook his ass up. And when he's done, he looks like the image of Jesus we all know. Mm -hmm. Which I have to say, the wig they installed on Benedict Cumberbatch looked really good. Mm -hmm. yeah. Better than a lot of y'all ladies running around here on Real Housewives with these wigs on. But... Um, so then we see Benedict Cumberbatch's character now as this Jesus looking figure, which some of the women in the salon go, oh, he looks like Jesus. Uh -huh. And then once one of them says, well, how do you know? 
you haven't seen him. And she goes, well, he just has that. So then I thought, oh, is this commentary on how, like, the image of Jesus we've all come to know that probably isn't accurate? But then the film doesn't do much with that. And then we see that Benedict's character ends up being crucified next to Clarence, but we don't see him being apprehended. So I was confused because we have real Jesus who real Jesus even says at a point, oh, they're going to come get me in three days to crucify. Yeah, with Jude. Oh, and we didn't say Judas is played by Michael Ward from Empire of Light. That's right. Mm -hmm. So then we have real Jesus. We have Clarence who's being treated like Jesus and we, crucified. We get a depiction of the Last Supper, which I thought was shot really well. Yes, and there's a funny moment because Jesus says to all his apostles, someone ratted us out or ratted out Clarence. And I want to know who it is. And he says, well, I'm going to know the first person to dip. I thought he said dip Mary Magdalene's braid in the gravy, like her hair braid. But he said bread, mm -hmm. like dough bread. And then we see that it's Judas who sold Clarence Of out. course. Of course. Mm -hmm. But I agree. I thought it was shot really well because everyone freezes except Judas. And Jesus is just looking at him, explaining why you're going to tell the truth because the guilt is overwhelming you. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of really strong moments. Yeah, I agree. And and that's why, uh, you know, I feel like I can appreciate something like this without necessarily probably adhering to the beliefs of those who made it. But. Another strong moment is when Clarence goes to free the slaves. There's this, like, they're called gladiator slaves. So there's this man who has gladiators apparently from all different walks of life and nationalities. And they're learning how to fight. I don't know why they just don't leave because they over... Like, they outnumber the person holding them. But when Clarence goes, the slave master's like, hell no. But if you can beat my best slave, I'll let you take him. And that's how we meet Barabbas or Barabbas. And they fight. Mm -hmm. Clarence wins. And then Barabbas goes with him. And, of course, all of these, a lot of these names and characters are reconstituted from the version of the Bible that people are familiar with because the Pontius Pilate asked the crowd to choose between Barabbas and Jesus and the crowd chooses Jesus to be executed. The actor playing Barabbas again? Omar Sy. I really liked him. Yeah. I, I mean, he's in a ton of stuff. Yeah. But I just thought his energy and what his character stood for and how the actor brought it, like he just had that presence that really, really worked. Oh, and then we didn't even bring up Caleb McLaughlin, who's also in The Heart of They Fall and Stranger Things. Uh, is it Zeke? He's all of a sudden like... Yeah, all of a sudden we get to chapter two. And so, because by the time we get to chapter two, it's Clarence, his best friend Elijah, and now Barabbas. But then we get to chapter two and they're going to go see Mary and Joseph. Now we have Zeke. It doesn't explain where he came from. Mm -hmm. I thought that was odd. Another good moment is Mary Magdalene, Tana Taylor's character, is being stoned by the people because they're saying that she sleeps with the Romans. And Elijah, who in the opening of the film, we get the sense that both Elijah and Clarence find Mary Magdalene attractive. So they like her. But Elijah walks upon Mary being stoned. And then he tries to cover her to protect her. And then all of a sudden, Jesus pops up and stops the stoning. And then says, those without sin can cast the first stone. And then he calls out... Jezebel. He calls out the one bitch Jezebel. Then he calls out her husband for having sex with a donkey. And So it's like, that was Well, humorous. Jezebel's like the OG bird. Yeah. The OG fast woman. Because, so, because he's like, pretty soon everybody's going to know your name. Yeah. Um, so the... My, my final thought was the resurrection of Clarence. Because we often say, like, Zombie Jesus Day for Easter. So, like, then I was thinking, oh, it's Zombie Clarence Day. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Because he's still got the the stigmata holes in his hands. But, uh, but, but again, I don't quite understand why we saw three figures of Jesus. And if there's a message there that I'm just not getting. Uh, yeah, I'm not quite sure either. Or how I'm supposed to feel at the end, really. Uh, and I, I wanted this to feel more like there's a Marty Feldman film he directed from, I think, 1980 called In God We Trust or Give Me That Primetime Religion that I, I, I wanted this, the essence of this to feel like. Um, and you had brought up Monty Python. Monty Python has a, a Christ movie, Life of Brian. Yeah, I, 
I, I kind of wish this would have pushed the more satirical side more. But I feel like we have to remind people that we reviewed The Last Temptation of Christ. Yes. Yeah. Willem Dafoe. What would you give The Book of Clarence? <sighs> I mean, this is a big swing of a film. Again, as I've already said, I, I don't know who the director feels this film is ultimately for. Uh, so I, I don't know. I, I kind of appreciate that sentiment. So I'm going to give it three out of five. I think it's fine. Uh, I did feel like, I mean, I was, there were moments when I was feeling like I was going to doze off. It does feel quite long. I don't quite understand a lot of what was happening. I'm giving it two and a half out of five. Anything else? No. Join us on Patreon. Listen to our podcast. Bye.